So welcome everyone to uh, this month's Repronym webinar series. Uh, we're delighted to have Dorit Kleeman here and I'll let Satra do the introductions in just a moment. While I have the floor here, I want to remind people that next month's presentation, February 4th, will be Sebastian Erks from McGill University talking about uh, metadata search and Repro Lake and you know, data discovery and cohort you know, collection types of topics. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Satra for today's introductions. Thanks, Dave. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, you can hear me, right? Uh, wonderful. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dorit Kleiman, uh, uh, who's at the University of Iowa at present as an assistant professor in the psychological and brain sciences department. Uh, but I got to do it while she was here in Boston uh, at MIT for a little bit of time. And over the last few years, uh, while she was at Caltech and Ralph Adolf's group uh, doing work. And Dorit's original work was on emotion recognition uh, in, the, in autism and focusing on the amygdala that brought her then to Boston at that time, or Cambridge more specifically. Uh, and I won't give things away. She's going to talk about some of those things uh, as part of this. But what she has done over the last few years, uh, working towards kind of investigating functional connectivity of the amygdala and autism, uh, is very repronym esque in a lot of ways, kind of trying to understand where reproducibility exists, where it doesn't, and how we investigate the swap of large data sets and what they might provide us. So without further ado, I'm going to let Dorit take it on from here. Well, thanks, Satra, and uh, thanks everyone for, um, for having me. Um, uh, so today, I'm uh, very excited to talk to you about a project that, as Satra mentioned, scientifically focused on the functional connectivity of the amygdala and autism. Uh, but today, I also want to talk um, about certain aspects of the scientific process. Uh, so for this project, uh, we actually um, chose to pre-register, and that decision comes with opportunities, especially towards reproducibility, but it also comes with challenges, and uh, challenges that we encountered before or during the process of the pre-registration, and also that we continue to encounter while we actually um, analyze the data. So um, the process of the pre-registration is already a crucial part of the science, at least for me. So how do we best really precisely define our scientific hypothesis and how do we best test them? And these are non-trivial questions, especially given all the space of possible decisions and human neuroimaging. And so today I wanna share this scientific process uh, with you. Um, as a disclaimer in the beginning, I'll not show you any final results of hypothesis testing. Um, and that is part of a future talk. So um, instead, I'll uh, focus our um, or I focus on our initial hypothesis, the process of the pre-registration, a pilot study that we've done to actually pre-register um, the best um, outline, and then what we've learned along the way. And I should mention, um, even after all this time in Zoom, I'm not capable of giving a talk and watching the uh, the chat. So if you do have a question, I encourage you to just unmute and speak up, and and I'll answer right away. All right. Um, so first of all, science is teamwork. And this project is really only possible because of my uh, fantastic collaborators. So uh, Ralph Edos um, at Caltech, where I did um, a postdoc after my postdoc at MIT. Um, then Paula Galdi from Edinburgh, um, who I think joined us today as well. Um, and in my lab at Iowa, I want to highlight uh, Brandon Egger, who has really um, been um, fantastic on data analysis um, side. Um, on the East Coast side, we have uh, Satra um, and Dorota from his team, uh, Dorota Jareka, and also um, in the original um, part of this project, Matthias uh, Gonsalves is involved, who's now on the other, on the other side of the country. Um, so this small team is, was the core team, but of course, um, um, all the work we're doing wouldn't be possible without open source tools, data repositories, and the community that designs and approves these tools constantly. So having these tools really allows us to address the scientific question and analyze the data that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and that allows us to improve reproducibility of our, of our science in the long run. 
All right, so let's start with a little bit of that science. Um, so one major focus in my lab is um, autism spectrum disorders and um, the social cognitive neuroscience uh, thereof. So um, autism is a pervasive neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by difficulties in social interaction, uh, communication, and restricted and repetitive behaviors. And really, despite so much in effort and interest, uh, little is known to date about the actual neural basis of um, these uh, behavioral symptoms in the human brain. And it remains especially unclear how um, changes or alterations in cognition arise from um, underlying uh, changes in brain function, um, one of them being connectivity, and, and then ultimately how these um, in turn relate to the behaviors that, that lead to the diagnosis um, in the first place. So, uh, there are many different hypotheses out about um, the mechanisms in autism, and I just want to highlight three here. So um, the first is a long-standing uh, hypothesis that autism is a disorder of connectivity. Uh, another hypothesis uh, um, is related to considering autism as a disorder of social cognition, uh, primarily, and that suggests that structures like the amygdala, as part of the social brain, uh, may be good neuroanatomical targets Provide for finding uh, and a neural basis of autism. And thirdly, uh, a perhaps more, more recent but no less popular hypothesis is that autism features high variability within and across individuals. And that may um, in part be due to multiple subtypes of autism. And it may be possible to detect those subtypes uh, from neuroimaging data. So in this project, uh, we wanted to bring these three motivations uh, together by investigating the functional connectivity of the amygdala in, in autism. And we wanted to focus on the patterns of the connectivity and their variability. And also we wanted to put a strong emphasis on their reliability and generalizability um, for our study for reasons I'll explain now. So um, there are many challenges in understanding the role of the amygdala in connectivity and autism, and I want to highlight at least uh, four here. So uh, the first one is that the amygdala is not a homogenous region. It consists of several neuronal subpopulations or nuclei, uh, but those are um, relatively hard to see in standard neuroimaging. Can you see my mouse? Yeah, okay, great. So here's the amygdala in the three orientations, and it looks like a grainy area, it's kind of hard to see any substructures there. And that's for the current uh, standard imaging resolution of one by one by one millimeter. Now, um, if we look at a chunk of um, medial temporal lobe cortex, um, and here this is an ex vivo scan at a resolution about 100 microns, we can um, see uh, by contrast different subregion in much greater detail, and we can actually see them with our eye. Um, now, if you want to study the amygdala subregion, because the idea is that those subregions actually subserve different functional roles, we have to define them in a certain way. Um, and there are different ways of defining amygdala subregions in vivo in humans. One of them is uh, to define them by their function. So here's a study from uh, Bickard and colleagues from 2012, which placed a priori seed regions in ventral medial prefrontal cortex anterior cingulate cortex and lateral orbital frontal cortex and subdivided amygdala voxels based on their strengths of connectivity as assessed with the resting state fMRI to those three initial seed regions in the cortex. And the resulting uh, uh, segmentation of the amygdala was in ventrolateral, medial, and dorsal that the authors attributed to um, uh, perception, affiliation, and diversion cortical networks. So that's one way of finding subregions defined by function in, in humans. Another way is a more recent study by Sylvester and colleagues that um, individually generated amygdala subdivisions with a k-means clustering approach. And this is actually a, a study based on the Midnight Scan Club data. So lots of data for few individuals. Uh, this approach actually revealed one subdivision that is selectively functionally collected to the default mode network, one of the uh, large-scale uh, functional network um, as assessed with resting state of many studies before. The second one was selectively uh, connected to the dorsal attention network, and then they identified a third cluster that was less specific, more unspecifically uh, related to the rest of the cortex. So here are two ways of functionally defining amygdala subregions by uh, resting state functional connectivity. Of course, you can also define subregions by anatomy, so by structural definition. 
And here is um, shown um, uh, one way of using cytoarchitectonics. This is work by Amans and colleagues in the Jülich Group. And this work is uh, the basis for a probabilistic atlas that's used in standard space and in FSL and SPM and most commonly used really. Uh, we can also use diffusion imaging um, and then define amygdala subregions based on structural connectivity to other brain regions um, that are often informed by, by uh, animal and human tracer studies. Um, another way is of course to use uh, in vivo imaging. Um, and this is based on in vivo data of about, um, I think about 500 microns from the Human Connectome Project data. And this is work by Mike Tishka from Caltech. Now, um, another way to segment the amygdala subregions is uh, provided in FreeSurfer. And that was actually um, a work done with uh, Zeynep Sejan. She's now at OSU and Bruce Fischel, Jean Augustinak and, e and Eugenio Iglesias over, over in Boston at MGH. And in this project, we've taken uh, 10 cases of those ex vivo um, uh, media temporal lobe sections and manually labeled amygdala subregions um, um, based on visible contrast and anatomy knowledge. And those labels were then uh, the basis for an atlas that can be applied to standard in vivo um, imaging here. So here you see uh, the original images are labeling and then how it looked like as a, a final projection onto um, subject space. And the important part here is that this atlas actually lets you um, define those amygdala subregions in individual subjects' native space. So one doesn't have to first transfer to, to template space, uh, but can do that with um, hopefully greater anatomical sensitivity. And that's really important because the amygdala in itself is so small and the subregions are even smaller. So you really want to reduce um, any geometric distortion of information because you already have to deal with um, imaging uh, susceptibility effects due to the location of the amygdala in the medial temporal lobes. Um, and actually, um, these challenges of geometric distortion and signal dropout in the amygdala are likely contributing to the next challenge as well. So previous work really um, shows us a great inconsistency in findings across multiple studies about amygdala connectivity. Um, so the majority of studies compares generally overall levels of connectivity between the amygdala or its subregions to other regions of the brain between autism and control subjects. Most studies find hypoconnectivity, so reduced connectivity. And there are also a number of studies which find hyperconnectivity, so increased connectivity of the amygdala to other brain regions. Some studies also find typical connectivity, so no group differences on a statistical level. Um, in addition, in autism, we have a great um, heterogeneity of behavioral symptoms, and that might actually also reflect increased variability of neural sickness, signals, um, and that has been sparsely studied so far in the amygdala and autism. Uh, another aspect that contributes to this challenge is that um, a number of studies have actually reported age-related connectivity changes across development, and that's also likely contributing to the difficulty of replicating uh, results across studies. Um, a third challenge is a general challenge with statistical reliability and reproducibility. Um, um, for instance, most studies have small sample sizes, often for very practical reasons, and often um, data only comes from one or few sites. Um, and for newer imaging results in general, and for resting state um, imaging data in particular, um, um, the results are sensitive to analytic flexibility. So the choice of denoising strategy can have significant effects on study results, and in turn, then also importantly on the reliability of group effects in autism. So here's um, one um, example of a study from Indiana from Yehe, Lisa Birch, and Dan P. Kennedy on uh, the Abide data set that among other things um, showed that group differences in the Abide data sets on whole brain functional connectivity were actually highly inconsistent across sites, regardless of the choice of denoising strategy. So here this figure is comparison of different sites and the rows and different denoising strategies at the bottom. Um, and the only take home message here is really that um, the strengths of um, correlation between group effects was relatively low across all of those sites. Um, so in other words, between side variability may be uh, greater um, than autism group differences and the heterogeneity in large data sets such as the abide um, is an additional major challenge here. Uh, the fourth challenge I wanna highlight is um, 
you know, how do you actually post the specific hypothesis to be tested? Um, you can just quantify the strength of so the magnitude of amygdala connectivity. You can define uh, different levels of neuroendomagal specificity, but those might not be actually sufficiently sensitive to detect group differences. So rather than simply hypothesizing hypo or hyper connectivity of the amygdala, it may be important to um, consider the precise pattern of its functional connectivity with the rest of the brain. All right. Um, so when starting this project, uh, we were discussing these challenges and how to best address them. Uh, so we decided to pre-register um, and think really hard in advance about what we're gonna do, uh, what we wanna test and how we tested and that we actually address these challenges in a, in a specific way. So our broad hypothesis was clear by now. We wanted to investigate functional connectivity of the amygdala and autism. And we wanted to use the Abide data set, which is a large um, public database of multi-site resting state fMRI data for about 2,000 subjects with and without autism. So it's an amazing resource. Um, and one of the goals we had with this uh, pre-registration was to reduce the space and of choices and exploration while still being able to, to leverage the scientific goals. So in short, if you're not familiar with the concept of a pre-registration, you basically precisely write down what you plan on doing every tiny step, and then you acquire the data. Uh, you process your data in the way you have outlined it, and you test your hypothesis exactly as planned, and then you report the results. Um, now, there are different types of pre-registrations. In our case, uh, the data was already acquired, and we pre-registered before doing the actual analyses. Um, so, um, the data set was available, but we didn't want to use the data set to um, um, define how we best test our hypothesis. So instead, uh, we wanted to make our choices independent of the actual data set. So luckily, uh, we had independent pilot data acquired um, at Caltech in the, in the Conti Center. And we decided to run uh, the pilot to make data-driven uh, decisions and evaluate those decisions on independent data. And in specific, we wanted to test out different denoising pipelines, different amygdala subsegmentations, uh, different quality assessment strategies. And along the way, we also uh, wanted to see um, um, and optimize the existing tools we were having for our specific purposes, since we wanted to analyze subject um, data in native space, volumetric and FS average surface space and in template MNI space across different uh, nuclei and comparisons. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we actually have the tools to, to ask these questions. So our pilot data included um, 10 subjects. Um, and uh, while we were working on um, this data analysis, we really, this was a long process of lots of meetings where we went back and forth on decisions and discussed and re-evaluated what is the best strategy to address the scientific questions we had. Um, and I'll wanna um, show you the outcome of this uh, pilot here. So I won't go into all the details for the sake of time, but in principle, um, we wanted to test three different denoising pipelines, which were uh, a pi pipeline from Finn and colleagues 2015 from the Functional Connect on Finn printed paper. And it was the uh, Poldrack 2018 um, uh, myconectome uh, strategy. And then the last one here was from the uh, Sylvester 2019 paper from the amygdala functional um, uh, k-means clustering approach. And we wanted to test out three different subdivisions. One, the free surface subdivisions, and here in specific, uh, the corticocentral medial and the basal lateral complex. Uh, the bigger subdivisions, here shown the three seats earlier from the paper. And uh, we wanted to try the clustering approach uh, put forward by the um, uh, Sylvester paper. So for each subject, we had two resting state runs. Um, and we calculated the functional connectivity between the amygdala subdivisions of all these three uh, segmentation strategies and 400 cortical parcels as defined by the, I'm just calling it for simplicity, the Schieffer 400 parcels. Um, and the measure of interest was within and between subject reliability of functional connectivity. So we had two runs. So we looked at how stable is uh, the functional connectivity uh, matrix per subject across those two runs. And then we compared the uh, reliability of these uh, uh, amygdala connectome, um, how we call it, um, across subjects. So ideally, you want to have relatively high within subject reliability and also uh, reasonably high between subject reliability. So um, I'm going to show you one large figure, and I'm going to run you through this um, uh, to begin with. Um, so for each of the comparisons or combinations of segmentation strategy and pipeline, I'll show you here on the y-axis the strengths of correlation 
between either uh, uh, the runs uh, within a subject or between a subject, and then for the different segmentation. So here for the free surfer, we tested out basolateral, cortical, intermedial, bilateral, and then split up per hemisphere. For the big herd subdivisions, uh, again, but within and between uh, correlation or reliability um, of the dorsal amygdala, medial amygdala, and ventrolateral amygdala. And for the clustering subdivisions, uh, they came uh, the three clustering approach, again, for within and between subject uh, correlation. Um, all right, so let's start with one plot here. Um, you see each data point is one subject um, and one subject's data with regards to how similar is the amygdala functional connectivity to the cortex within a subject or between subjects. Um, and you see um, by looking at it uh, relatively quickly that there is reasonably variation across individuals, which is expected, and that we have higher uh, uh, reliability of uh, amygdala functional connectivity within than between subjects. That's also completely expected. And we see clearly variation here. Um, now, if you look at, um, now I'm throwing a big uh, plot at you at all the pipelines uh, and segmentations, we see massive variation across these different combinations. Um, the um, overall best performance in terms of reliability is actually the pipeline A, which is the FIN 2015 pipeline and the free surface subdivisions. Uh, overall, um, the lowest reliability was for pipeline C, and um, the, the clustering subdivisions. Um, and, and the pipeline B and the Baker subdivisions kind of in the middle. So what we can take from this analysis is that overall pipeline A and free surface segmentation in our pilot produced the most reliable amygdala functional connectivity. Quick um, question. Yeah. Were the pilot subjects all typical or include ASD or? Oh. Yeah, I should have mentioned, those are um, 10 adults around uh, 33 years old and all typical. Okay, thanks. Um, another question we wanted to ask with the pilot analysis was the signal coverage in the amygdala. So the amygdala is tucked in deep and uh, medial temporal and signal quality is often very poor there. So we wanted to make sure um, uh, that we have a way of addressing that and uh, picking out subjects that don't have good coverage. So um, in this pilot, uh, we looked at um, spatial-temporal signal-to-noise ratio here on the left side, and temporal fluctuations and signal-to-noise ratio here. I will plot that on the right side, and I'm showing this for you for the free surfer and the uh, bigger subdivisions. So let's start with uh, spatial-temporal SNR. So this is um, um, basically uh, the spatial-temporal mean signal in a region divided by the signal in non-brain or airspace that we typically consider noise. And as expected, here we have higher uh, spatial temporal SNR in uh, the whole brain, uh, gray matter mask, and here are uh, the free surfer subdivisions. Uh, for um, the Bickert, uh, um, the, the same regions, just in template space, and here for the um, Bickert subdivisions is a little bit more variance, but overall we see the same pattern, uh, subcortical is lower as cortical as expected, and we have some variations across subjects and for the Bickert also variation across um, uh, sieve regions. Now, the temporal spatial um, SNR is simply dividing the mean of the uh, temporal signal by its uh, standard deviation. And here we see the same pattern, higher signal to noise ratio in cortical regions, as opposed to the amygdala segmentations um, and variation across individuals and nuclei. Uh, but much more so, um, at least qualitatively, in the MNI template segmentations. So bottom line here is it's important to assess SNR directly and to pick up on variations and outliers. Um, and this is the way um, uh, we, we ch uh, chose to do it. All right. So um, I told you about the challenges. I told you about the pilot. Um, so now let me tell you about the decisions uh, we actually made based on our pilot data. Um, so first of all, well, uh, we decided to use the um, amygdala subdivision by the free surfer atlas and here bilateral and um, basolateral uh, amygdala complex and corticose intermedial. And uh, for the rest of the brain, we defined as the 400 uh, cortical parses from Shefa and eight subcortical regions. Um, we decided to use multiple metrics of connectivity, strengths, reliability, and the precise pattern of amygdala functional connectivity uh, between subjects and groups. Uh, we decided to use a large um, sample as we could, uh, the about uh, one and two data sets. 
for um, the practical reasons of being able to not include also noise about different developmental trajectories, we chose um, a sample of over 16 or over 15 and uh, um, um, up to 50 years old. Um, we wanted to focus our main analysis on the pipeline with the uh, most reliable uh, functional connectivity estimations in the pilot analyses, uh, so the thin pipeline. And um, we wanted to test our uh, generalizability across pipelines, amygdala subdivisions, and amygdala as a whole. Um, so we're also defining exploratory analysis that address these questions uh, with the big root subdivision and uh, the second best uh, or the second most reliable pipeline from, um, from the pilot. And um, we also um, wanted to assess um, signal to noise ratio by looking at um, the measures I introduced earlier. Uh, segmentation quality of um, the tissue properties, um, head motion, IQ, and sense. And lastly, uh, we also decided to use Bayesian inference testing as opposed to classic null hypothesis significance testing. And that was motivated by the advantage that uh, by using Bayesian inference, we can quantify support um, not only against the null hypothesis, but also in favor of the null hypothesis. So instead of just being able to say something significant or not, we can actually um, uh, quantify the odds in favor or against the null hypothesis with this approach. Um, so now I want to run you through our three hypotheses. Um, so first, we, uh, one hypothesis is that uh, we'll find weaker connectivity overall in autism. The second is that we find uh, um, that the precise pattern of connectivity between the amygdala and the rest of the brain will differ between autism and controls. And the third hypothesis was um, dealing with um, increased uh, between subject variability and autism. Now, these are pretty vague. Um, and within the process of pre-registration, we specify these even more and defined sub-hypotheses. Now, briefly run you through these. So the most simple initial hypothesis asks whether um, the autism group shows overall, in, on average, weaker um, um, magnitude. So, um, uh, I'm sorry, lower magnitude of functional connectivity to the amygdala of the rest of the brain. The second sub-hypothesis then tests whether um, uh, this magnitude difference might persist if it's normalized um, across the whole brain to be more anatomically specific. And the third version tests whether um, a selection of regions that are most strongly connected to the amygdala subdivisions will probably provide a greater evidence for reduced functional connectivity in the amygdala. So we would only test a subset of this um, um, 408 regions. Regarding the, uh, the pattern, we'll also test three hypotheses. So we'll correlate uh, group average amygdala connectivity to compare um, across, uh, across the whole brain. Um, and the second uh, sub-hypothesis, again, I'm only looking at a subset of the 10% strongest connections uh, testing whether pattern differences become more evident if they're anatomically specific. And the third version is to um, look at a specific um, network, a default mode network, which had been previously implicated in autism. For the third hypothesis, uh, we'll um, actually state relatively simply and just wanted um, to test for the distribution differences of pairwise subject correlations of the amygdala uh, connectivity per group. So, um, but I've mentioned that we um, had at some point, I think a sheer endless list of possible exploratory analysis we also wanted to run. Um, but uh, for feasibility purposes, we um, uh, pinned it down to, um, to just these few that I'm gonna tell you now. So first we wanted to test whether differences in functional uh, connectivity magnitude were also associated with individual impairment. So here we're gonna look at correlations between uh, functional connectivity measures and uh, social measures here, the SRS and the ADOS. Um, um, second, in an exploratory analysis, we also want to test the generalizability to the second pipeline. So we're going to rerun hypothesis one and two with uh, the myconectome pipeline from the Podrack paper. Um, third, um, we test generalizability to the Baker segmentations and template space. So we're going to run all analyses again, just with the different seed regions. And then thirdly, we're going to ask um, the, the hard question of, well, now that we've run it in two different subsegmentations, um, does it actually buy us any new insight? Could we have just used the whole amygdala instead of ignoring and, and ignoring the sub uh, region? So that's what we're going to do in, in this um, um, other exploratory analyses. So then uh, we wrote about, I think, a 30-page document, which felt like a paper and two rebuttals. 
and submitted that as a pre-registered um, um, document to OSF that includes all the reasonings for the decisions, description of the pilot analyses, and the detailed analysis plan. And it's, it's currently private, but if anybody's interested, uh, if you figure just shoot me an email, I'm happy to, to share it already. Um, all right. So now I've talked a lot about the scientific process, um, but Can we've I actually- um, no, I'm sorry, yeah. I'll jump in one more time. So <laughs> that's filed as a pre-registration. -regist pre Some journals do pre-registered -reg pre report types of things. Can you say if you did or didn't do that or any thoughts you have we on that? We tried that, but um, uh, the journals we tried were not interested in it for reasons that we are not fully aware of, or they didn't share that with us. So um, after trying to, uh, uh, pre-submission inquiries, we, we decided to just opt for um, uh, this pre-registration. Not just, we opted for the pre-registration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, <laughs> and, and that's fabulous. Uh, not in the context of this, but I'd like to hear more about that experience offline sometime. Yeah, great. happy, happy to. Um, all right, um, so I've told you that we're gonna um, only analyze subjects from the abide data set between 16 and 50. Uh, we had a couple of other inclusion and exclusion criteria, mostly the IQ needed to be over 70 to look at um, relatively normal and elevated intellectual functioning. And that led us with a final sample of 302 um, autism subjects and 342 control subjects to begin with. Um, we um, did our data processing. Um, I should mention the, the main bulk of the data processing is actually on all abide. Uh, but we're gonna focus the hypothesis testing only on this subset. Um, so we used a minimal processing in fMRI prep. And here we actually ran the data already through multiple versions of fMRI prep. Um, and you might know that that's not a non-trivial um, um, effort in terms of computations, um, but it's motivated by improvements in processing um, with these tools that, that just happen along the way and that we thought are really necessary um, and also good for benefiting um, the output of the data. Um, after fMRI prep, we're using uh, D, uh, RSD noise, uh, which is a denoising tool um, written by uh, Paula Galdi. Um, it's a Python-based, customizable, and extensive pipeline for uh, resting state fMRI data. It was actually originally designed uh, to run on the Human Connectome project, but along the way, and with these um, uh, pilot analysis, uh, Paula has really done amazing work in making this code work very flexible and also working with uh, fMRI prep data in, in various output and input spaces. So go check it out. Um, okay, um, what's the time? Okay, 30 minutes, great. I uh, wanted to um, uh, tell you a little bit about what we've learned so far, um, also about um, our pre-registration strategy um, by looking at uh, quality control in that data so far. Um, so the first kind of no-brainer uh, quality control is to look for head motion. And here we set a priori that we're going to exclude any scan where frame-wise displacement is um, uh, has more than 40% of um, over 0.2 millimeter frame-wise displacement. Um, and here I'll show this um, to you for, for the sites that were still, um, uh, had uh, subjects that fulfilled our inclusion criteria. And here the um, uh, line is um, data above the threshold was excluded. And let, uh, that led to an exclusion of 143 subjects of the 644. Now, I should mention that this threshold is relatively arbitrarily. One can choose other thresholds, and that's maybe what, what others will do in the future. Um, the second uh, quality control I want to highlight here is that we um, looked at segmentation quality from the automated free server segmentations by defining we're going to look at each um, subject which data falls um, beyond three standard deviations from the mean for um, uh, total gray matter volume and left and right amygdala volume. Um, so here's this data plotted on the left side, um, right and left amygdala volume, and on the right side, gray matter volume, um, are both corrected by intercranial volume. And this procedure flagged 30 scans. Now, um, I've looked at all of these 30 scans, and it turns out that um, all subjects um, who had uh, great, uh, greater gray matter volume actually all came from one side. And um, by looking at the side here, I'm showing you one scan. Um, there's nothing obviously wrong with the segmentation that I'm not displaying here, but what I've noticed is that the scans are relatively grainy. So something might be up with the contrast that affects how um, free surfers is able to estimate uh, gray matter volume. Um, the second uh, type of flags were relatively high amygdala volume cases uh, at automated segmentations, but 
just looking at it doesn't show that there's anything obviously wrong. It's just a relatively large segmentation. Um, then we picked up on a few subjects, though, that showed obvious um, segmentation errors, as you can see here. This is obviously not a correct segmentation. Um, uh, probably this failed at the skull strip, actually. And uh, a second example case I want to show you is um, you see the ringing here, probably. Um, um, it's a, a large um, motion case, so uh, the segmentation failed here also. Um, interestingly, those were picked up by amygdala volume and not grain reader volume, uh, which shows you something about um, what you can what you can pick up on by these measures. Um, and of course, we could also look at all the scans, um, which is feasible for this type of um, size of the data set, but not feasible for you know uh, larger data sets like the UK Biobank or others. Um, okay, so we excluded actually only eight subjects due to this procedure. Um, then uh, amygdala both signal quality, as I've mentioned, uh, we looked at uh, two measures of signal quality and we decided a priori we wanted to exclude um, any subjects where any of those measures would fall below three standard deviations from the site mean this time. Um, so I'm going to show you now a plot where regional SNR is plotted on the y-axis. Color-coded, you see um, signal-to-noise ratio measure from the basal lateral complex, the cortical central medial uh, complex, first site here on the x-axis. And for comparison, we chose um, uh, the pericalcarine cell close bilaterally as a cortical comparison marker. Um, and when I plot signal to noise ratio extracted, you immediately see um, that there's quite some variation. Um, and there are three sites which are massively out of range as compared to all other sites. And uh, we think that this depends on the process of how we define spatial temporal SNR here in specific, how we define the signal um, that comes from, from the air, the noise level. And it could be that some of those sites have been skull stripped or other um, data pr uh, procedures have been done to the raw data. Um, and we're currently trying to figure out what's going on here. Uh, so it's not, at this point, it's not fully clear to us. Uh, regarding TFSNR, that was even more um, interesting to begin with. So here again, the same um, um, color coding and the same plotting per site. Um, and you notice that there's this extreme outlier in one site that is probably due to some interpolation in fMRI prep. Again, we're looking into it. We're not really sure. Um, if we actually zoom in here into TFSNR, we see a much more expected picture. We see variations across um, uh, sites, and we see um, uh, variations across uh, signal to noise level, res uh, level ratios across cortex to subcortical. And we see that there are a couple of outliers per site that show markedly different signal to noise ratio in the amygdala subregions, and that's what we want to pick up on with this um, exclusion criteria or signal uh, um, quality assessment tool. All right, um, so we don't know how many we're excluding yet because we're just digging into this uh, into these funky issues I just showed you. Uh, we have other exclusion criteria that um, uh, led to relatively small exclusion so far. Um, and in total, um, we've already excluded or set, we're going to exclude 25% uh, of the data without accounting for SNR just yet. All right. Um, so what's next, you might ask. Um, so um, I'm just going to run you through the list of our next steps as uh, part of the scientific process here. So first, um, we're actually uh, planning on uh, redoing all of our fMRI processing again with uh, 22.6. Um, because there is an um, improvement in slice time correction, which we want to um, take advantage of. And um, then we're going to rerun all of our post-processing steps and quality assessment. And while that sounds a little painful, um, you know, it's a very good way of actually testing and optimizing our analysis code for, for means of reproducibility of sharing that code later on. Um, then we're going to uh, run our final analyses and uh, test our actual hypothesis. And uh, we also plan on pushing um, all of fMRI prep by data um, and, and the subsequent quality steps um, to, to the Amazon S3 bucket. Um, of course, we're also planning on uh, disseminating the research findings. Um, and with that, also publish um, all the code to run all the steps of the analysis. Um, now, running or investigating amygdala connectivity in autism in the abide data set is really just just a start at least in, in my research program so the next step is then to test uh, the replication of the whatever results we find and the possible extension of these results in in independent data and here um, i plan to uh, acquire a smaller sample at the university of iowa 
uh, with uh, more current imaging standards. So using probably multiband acquisition parameters and field maps, which is something that's rare um, done in Abide because that data set just has been acquired a while ago. Um, for um, the type, or we also planning on having more data per subject, so having multiple runs to look at reliability, similar to the pilot I've showed you, and more dense sampling with probably shorter TRs. Um, and in the longer run, in addition to resting state functional connectivity, we also want to complement the investigations of you know, intrinsic organization uh, uh, with uh, stimulus processing. So we're planning on using movie fMRI to um, activate potentially different uh, um, subnetworks and, and study connectivity in that way. Um, all right, so um, I'm almost um, at the end of um, the talk, but I just want to come back to what I've originally set out with. And so um, from that, we learned a lot um, and we learned that one of the main challenges with the pre-registration of this um, type of, of study is how to best predict the aspects of the data that we haven't seen yet. So um, choices that we made are mostly due on the, uh, based on the, on the pilot data and those have obviously biases. And these biases may pan out differently depending on the data set and, and the size you actually study in the end. So, um, and it's, it's kind of impossible to predict what new developments um, happen also in terms of tools that happen in the meantime. Um, so we have to decide um, if there are new developments, whether it's worth rerunning um, certain types of processing or not. And here, um, just a side note, having code that can flexibly be rerun um, on, on certain aspects of, of data comes in really handy. Um, regarding the opportunities, um, I just wanna say that despite all those challenges, we think it's worth it. So we wanna make sure that the effects are, are not just due to analytic choices, but that the effects we find in our studies are generalizable across those decisions. Um, and we want to study results, uh, or we want our study results to be reproducible. Um, and if our study results are reproducible, we can confirm hypothesis uh, across multiple data sets, and we can also build a foundation to build new hypotheses. And um, I think the field can really only move forward if we can address these previous inconsistencies in autism research and overcome those challenges that I've outlined earlier. And I think uh, reproducible science is really the, the best way to do that. Um, so um, with that in mind, I just wanna mention um, that we're actually hiring in my lab on multiple levels. So I'm currently looking for a lab manager to start in the fall. We have a, a position for postdoc available and um, also a full-time scientific programmer. So yeah, email me, spread the word if, if um, anyone comes to mind here. Um, and with um, that, I also want to, again, thanks um, to all of my collaborators, um, to my funding um, uh, sources, um, and of course, to all the participants and families, and again, to the community uh, for those open source tools. Um, without this, the work wouldn't be possible. And with that, I am done, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Great, fabulous. Um, those last set of criteria you mentioned you really resonate with the Reprenim way in ways that you know are said even better than you know sometimes I feel like we say it. Uh, and an example uh, that really stands out to me is that traditionally people have a huge fear of having to go back and redo everything once, uh, once, in the, and then in you know real cases it could be three or four or five times you know that you need to go back and redo it. And I think that's a a, a good uh litmus test so to speak that if you can do a process in your facility that you know maybe daunting and maybe annoying but is not a game stopper to whoops okay you know free surfer has a new version we'll just rerun the whole thing if you have an infrastructure in place that makes that kind of rerun everything you know just part of normal living that's a great example of you know one the steps towards reproducibility into just a, a good data management, data processing you know, environment you know, in one's environment. So again, I think that's I know, just it was great to hear you, you know, talk about that kind of stuff in, in that way. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, OK, questions from the world. Feel free to uh, unmute yourself and jump in here. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, I have one question. So second for a talk, it's, it's, it's really nice to know that everybody's trying to, uh, to, to adapt the uh, more scientific procedure for the uh, of reproducibility analysis is nice. 
I, I've been doing a similar thing, and uh, but 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 for for uh, essential tremors patients, and my uh, my question is, uh, you you're doing a pilot study on on your local data set, which is is that part of the uh, a big data set, or it's 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 only a small data set from your own. No, yeah. Um, thanks for maybe I haven't made that clear. It, this is actually um, a, a data set that was acquired at uh, Caltech at the CBIC Imaging Center, mm -hmm. um, and that um, it's actually a good feature. Now we're just um, in revisions of publishing uh, that data set. It's 160 or 17 uh, community um, uh, um, individuals um, from uh, the greater LA area with resting state scans, high resolution uh, structural imaging, mm -hmm. intensive. Um, social um, and uh, demographic characterization on a behavioral level, and even mm -hmm. movie fMRI data, which will hopefully be um, available as a data repository relatively soon when we get reviewer comments of our revision spec. Um, and this is where we took the 10 subjects from, so completely independent data set. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, when we we're, were doing the pilot study on an independent data set and, uh, and trying to figure out we, uh, which pipeline is, is the best for, for our purpose. Uh, are we sure that this, uh, this pipeline works so well for our, for our ma ma major hypothesis testing procedure? Um, no, we're not. <laughs> okay. Um, this is, I think, exactly one of the um, challenges we ran in already with the signal-to-noise ratio estimations. Uh, we don't know that mm. because we don't know what certain types of features um, or aspects might come up in the data sets we're testing. And with the abide data set, and that might be true for, for your case as well, if you have different acquisition parameters across sites that might even introduce how well those denoising mm -hmm. pipelines work. And maybe um, just to highlight again, so we decided what um, that the reliability of the um, functional connectivity of the amygdala to the rest of the cortex would be mm -hmm. one way of, of studying the quality of the denoising pipeline. Um, of course, otherwise it's, it's kind of hard Hard to estimate what is a good denoising pipeline, right? We just wanted to see with the different um, versions of denoising, can we get reliable connectivity of the amygdala? Whether that's mm -hmm. going to be meaningful in terms of studying autism, we, we, we don't know, but we wanted to make that decision as independent as possible. Yeah, I see, I see. So with the pilot study, we're, we're, we're showing that the, the procedure we are doing is, is correct. No, no, uh, it doesn't matter which pipeline we are truly for our uh, pilot data, but actually when we are carrying out the analysis for the, for, for the whole, for the, for the real data, we, we can do that again and choose the best pipeline. Yeah, and okay. um, yeah. maybe, maybe Satra, I want to chime in here, um, but you know, one idea that has been put forward by different people in the field is really, mm -hmm. instead of just, um, you know, running the study or writing a paper with one specific preprocessing pipeline, we could implement that we run uh, our study with different preprocessing pipeline. I think it's called multiverse processing, right? Um, and, or multiverse analyses. So to implement a uh, different processing pipeline to actually test each time whether the effects one sees in a certain study is just due to certain features of um, um, processing or whether it's actually a true underlying effect. Uh, and that's why we in our study opted for testing two different denoising pipelines. Uh, of course, you can choose many more and our choice is relatively arbitrary as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think it's really making sure that you can generalize the findings across different analytic decisions. Um, and yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in very briefly on, on, on that notion. I, I, I think there's a broad spectrum on one end. We don't know why we're choosing something for certain things. There might be a choice made on, oh, everybody does this, and hence that choice is made. And at the other end, we are very clear because of some criteria, like the age criteria that Dorit spoke about is, is a fairly clean criteria that one might look at and say, okay, there's not too much. There might be a developmental trajectory we're not interested in. We'll cut off over here. But there's all the things in between those two extremes where we don't always have scientific reasons for making some of those choices. So I just posted in the chat a paper that came out after we had written this pre-registration uh, that looks at certain aspects of, again, denoising strategies for doing uh, connectome stability within individuals uh, focused on an application of saying,
can I identify an individual from their connectome? And each application might have its own set of criteria as well in the future. So I was going to toss Dorit a question, which is, even though we, this has not all been finished, now that you're seeing this variability, would your future pre-registration be different? Probably, yes. My future pre-registrations are probably going to try to be more flexible or even more flexible with that regard. But as we encountered, and you know this, Cetera, and one has to limit oneself in terms of um, pragmatics at some point as well to, to make a start on testing a specific hypothesis. And one start here is having two pipelines, and that can be the starting point for future pre-registrations as well. But I think along the way, the community will probably develop into hopefully a standardized way of incorporating some of those analytic decisions in the scientific process to begin with. Um, most people probably don't want to hear this, and it is going to be a little bit more effortful. Um, but I think, um, especially with uh, in a field where we have so inconsistent results across many studies, such as in autism, um, I think that, that that can be of high value. And I and also want to point out that these challenges, the challenges that I've mentioned, are are not specific to studying autism. The same is true in in all kinds of um, psychiatric or maybe even neurological disorders where, where there are inconsistent results that are in part at least due to um, uh, these methodological challenges that I try to outline today. Does that answer your question? Having yeah, said you. that, can I, um, I mean, we love Abide and it was groundbreaking and, you know, to, to do it that way, but it is retrospectives, you know, sort of post hoc you know, data collections, and you do run into all sorts of inter-site issues and things like that. Um, I don't know if you anything, wanted to say anything about, you know, the ideal world being you know, a new ABCD-like, you know, study of autism, I don't know, something that's a little more prospectively organized and large end, I think, of course, it is would be a good idea, but how much, is there a limit to what Abide can actually tell us because of its uh, design? I think so. So, so first of all, um, it is one run per subject. And um, the runs are, if I remember correctly, between four and 10 minutes long. And that has many practical reasons, but um, having uh, a, a way of testing within subject reliability of a measurement, so more data per subject, I think is really crucial moving forward. Um, but at the time that was what people were doing and it was great and it's still great. I mean, I benefit from it. So I think it's a still a great research that let us test certain hypotheses such as in our case, can we actually use this data set to, to study the amygdala, which is challenging to study given its location and signal quality. And um, I, uh, it, it's very well possible that we will find out um, that with our strategies that we chose in this pre-registration and with the Abide data set, we might not be able to find a consistent effect in autism that is consistent across the sites. Um, I, you know, I've left out many details, of course, of how we're going to account for site differences and subject effects and confounds that are all going to be taken care of in, in, the, in the Bayesian inference models in one way or the other. But um, um, now I lost my train of thought. Let me get it back. Um, finding a way to assess within subject reliability, I think, is, is crucial moving forward. Um, and maybe just in, in terms of a smaller scale. So having arrived here at the University of Iowa, I've been you know, learning, uh, uh, getting to know my colleagues who also do neuroimaging research. We have a thriving neuroimaging community here that's basic researchers, um, uh, psychiatrists, neurologists, you know, a very um, variety of investigations going on. And we've been starting to discuss um, how can we as a community in Iowa even arrive at a, at a common sequence, we can compare data sets across studies at our scanner. So, so I think um, this is an effort that can be done on a smaller scale at, 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 at the university and institution, but can also be done in a, in a much larger scale. Um, and I think um, uh, maybe Satra again can speak to this, but there are efforts of um, 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 trying to get institutions to, to stick to certain um, community standards, not just on like, uh, how am I gonna name my, my, um, my uh, Nifty or the BITS imaging structure, but also how to, maybe what type of parameters or what type of sequences to use, um, and maybe also what stimuli to use in the long run, given, given the push for, for endogenous um, stimulation um, in, in, as opposed to resting state. Yeah, I think uh, just chiming in on Dave's 
original question, I think the challenge is whether every little scientific investigation needs an ABCD like study. And where is yeah. the balance between the I'm going to learn about the brain versus I'm going to learn about autism and amygdala? And is there a space that is a happy medium between those two ends? I think that's the current challenge because everybody would love, if possible, yeah. to do an ABCD like study on their question. <laughs> yeah. uh, but given resources, is there a place where consistency could be arrived at? And how do we kind of improve? For example, this pre registration told us that we haven't yet answered many questions about how to pre register. And could we as a community? come to a place where we can say, no, pre-registration almost becomes like writing software code. It's deterministic. We can get to a point where we say, this is where we need to, we can make the choices. This is where we leave it to computation to provide us flexibility. And I think that's the part which I would love to see happen a little more. Uh, hasn't, I think, happened yet in the context of whether it's sequence choices, whether it's uh, analytic choices, um, and that's a part, I don't know why everybody has to go through that process every time. Yeah, yeah thanks for putting the question back on track. <laughs> um, and maybe uh, relating that to, to the future um, of, of this project, um, of course, it's easy for me to say our um, resting state scans need to be longer and I, I want more data per subject, but it's not easily administered in 2000 subjects, right? It's, it's an impossible task to do. So um, as, a, as an investigator on, on my end, what, what I can do, what we're trying also in, in a different project in autism is really dense sampling for individuals and trying to uh, address this between subject variability with uh, lots of data within an individual across multiple time points to um, get at variability um, um, in, in that sense, because it's just impossible to have 2000 subjects or even 200 subjects at a side is um, out of the scope of normal NIH grants, at least you, uh, unless you have you know, an autism center of excellence or, or something like that. It's just hard to get large amounts of data that get at that uh, between subject variability in that sense. I think that's a good thing to remember that, yes, the, the big expensive data collections are one thing, but we still have to keep reminding ourselves how to do the small science of regular R01s in addition to the big national initiatives or international yeah. initiatives. And just, yeah, most of what we, most of us do are these, you know, quote, small, you know, things, and we've got to be able to still do that in an appropriate way. And again, maybe national standards for how you acquire your small data so that it has a chance of heck of going back together. Again, abide is great, but because it was early and it was very heterogeneous, you know, stuff, you know, abide three, you know, with some you know, standards of how people are acquiring things, you know, may improve some of that kinds of things. Anyway, so just thank you for again illuminating that uh, that point. So I think we've come to the end of our hour. If there's any burning questions, feel free to shout them out right now. But otherwise, I want to take this opportunity to thank Dorit again. Uh, and you know, Satra for the introduction, and uh, invite everyone to come back you know, in a month uh, to hear about uh, data searching with uh, Sebastian Ertz in uh, February 4th. Well, okay. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Thank you, Dorit. Okay.